maybe one that you've never seen before, but do what I told you. And first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna identify where is the input, okay? Where are the input values on the screen? Can you guys see them? Down here? Yes. These are the values that we've put in, all right? So title volume 500, respiratory rate 20, PEEP of five, FIO2 of 40, okay? The one thing that I haven't given you here is the inspiratory flow rate, which is 60 liters per minute. On the servo eye, you have to click additional settings in order to see that, okay? But whatever, okay? Now you know what it is. Now here's output. These are output values over here. So the actual respiratory rate, the peak pressure is up here. This is the minute volume. And then we have our waveforms, okay? Three waveforms, you got pressure, flow, volume. Okay, if your ventilator only shows you two of these, which one do you throw out? And I think there is a right answer. Which one is your, which one is your least useful waveform, do you think? It's where my pointer is. Flow. The volume. It's, it's uh, volume. Volume is the least helpful, least useful. Okay, so if your vent only shows you two waveforms, Make sure it's pressure and flow for the most part, okay? Your best friend is flow, okay? Flow is gonna give you the most information about what mode you're in, and it's also gonna give you the most information about how your vent mode is syncing, your, your patient and your vent are syncing together, okay? Pressure is very helpful in, in many cases, but if you, if, if, if you want a best friend, it's, it's usually flow, okay? Make sense? All right, so looking at this display, and this is not meant to be a trick question. What kind of mode is this? Do you think this is a volume control mode or a pressure control mode? And I'm very well aware that the answer is given away there, but I want you to tell me what it is and how you can tell. It's Your curve is exactly the same in each of the, in each breath, the flow is the same, but the pressure varies. So that's how you know that the volume is constant and the pressure is the, dependent variable. Excellent. Okay, that's great. So this is a volume control mode. And, um, and, and one thing that you can see is that the pressure, although these are similar, they're not superimposable, right? Now be careful because there are some advanced modes where the monkey might be twirling the knob inside and changing things breath to breath, but that would be a really sneaky thing to do and I'm not doing that to you, okay? But the best way to tell is to look at this flow tracing and see, yep, this is a straight line, razor straight flow there, okay? You're not gonna see that in a pressure control mode, right? Okay, it might approximate this, but it's gonna have some variability, sort of like these have variability. That makes sense, okay? Now also be careful, this doesn't have to be a square waveform, okay? This is a square flow wave. Sometimes we use a decelerating flow wave, so it can be a triangle but it will still be a, a straight line, okay? If it's straight as an arrow, you know that, that the monkey is regulating flow and volume for you and you have to worry about pressure. Does that make sense? Okay, so see how that works? All right, okay. Anybody questions on this? We're all good? Looking at our, at our servo interface here, okay. All right, so then we get a blood gas back on our patient. Okay, pH is 7.32, CO2 is 65, PO2 is 50. All right, the question that we have to answer all the time is, are we happy with that? Or do we need to change something based on that gas? All right, and if we don't care, why did we get it? Okay, but we got it, so we must care. Anything we want to change and why? Um, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, okay. So it looks like he has respiratory acidosis, so it's a ventilation issue. So we are looking at either increasing the respiratory rate or increasing the tidal volume in his case. Um, I think I would like to blow off more CO2 by reducing his respiratory rate. Okay, but back up now, what was our diagnosis? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's true, this is the ARDS. This is ARDS. So, so you are absolutely right. This is a respiratory acidosis situation, but that isn't our biggest problem. You buying that? Okay. Okay. So. It's certainly not our patient's biggest problem right now. Because what's our patient's biggest problem right now? Oxygenation. So his PaO2 is 15. Yeah, his squash isn't getting enough oxygen. 
Okay. So we might have to worry about the CO2 later. And don't, don't forget about the CO2. We're going to come back to that. But our first order of business is we got to worry about oxygen. What's your favorite target for, for uh, PaO2 in a patient with ARDS or any patient on a ventilator for that matter? What are you going to use? What's your range? What is it? It's more like more than 65. Okay, 65 would be great. Uh, the guidelines say 55 to 80. Nobody worries about the top limit, right? I mean, if it's 80 or higher, we don't care. Mm. What we care is that it's at least 55 because that's going to correlate with a saturation of probably somewhere around 88, 89, right? Which we think is sort of the threshold of safety for the brain and the heart and the kidneys, the ones that are really oxygen hungry, okay? So we are not happy with a PO2 of only 50. Everybody agree? Yep. Okay, in our ARDS patient. So the question is, what can we change that might improve the O2? And I'm gonna give you a hint here. There's only two things you can change to improve oxygenation in any ventilator mode, all right? Keep only two happy. things. Tell me what they are. The PIP and the FiO2. FiO2 is one of them, for sure. We can turn that up from 40 to 50 or to 60 or to 70 or to 80 or to 100. Once you're at 100, you can't go to 110. Remember that, okay? What else can we turn up to improve oxygenation? PIP. PEEP is correct as a subset of the mean airway pressure, okay? Anything that we can do to raise the mean airway pressure will improve oxygenation. PEEP is by far the simplest, easiest one to do that. Make sense? Okay. Now, the reason I make that distinction is if somebody had said tidal volume, that's actually not wrong because raising tidal volume actually raises mean airway pressure, usually slightly, but sometimes a lot, okay, depending on physiology, okay? So it wouldn't actually be wrong, but PEEP is by far your best bet. Let's take a look at PEEP for a minute. You've all seen diagrams like this, right? Where you, you've got a, an atelectatic segment of lung, you've got an open segment of lung, so part of it's ventilated, part of it's not. You've got VQ mismatch here, right? You've got blood coming by, a non-ventilated section of lung, that could be a lobule or a lobe or a whole lung or a few alveoli, whatever it is, that blood's not picking up oxygen, right? You've all seen this. Yes? Not head? Yeah, okay. And when that blood that is going by a non-aerated alveolus mixes, that's, that's shunted blood. When that shunted blood mixes with the oxygenated blood, that's going to lower the overall oxygenation of the blood that's going back to the left heart. That's bad, right? So we don't like shunt. Shunt's a big problem with oxygenation. And one of the, and, and so what what is what is PEEP or anything else that increases the mean airway pressure going to do? Why does that improve oxygenation? You will keep the alveoli open and increase the surface area that um, interchange the oxygen with the blood vessels. Exactly right. Anything that raises the mean airway pressure, for example, PEEP will recruit collapsed areas of lung. It will push fluid out of flooded areas of lung, right? And it will expand contracted areas of lung and increase that surface area so that you get more gas exchange, right? Really basic, sorry it's so basic. I hope I'm not insulting you. But this is so important to remember, okay? Anything you can do to raise the mean airway pressure will improve oxygenation. Everything else that you do with vent modes mostly affects ventilation, all right? But raising the mean airway pressure, raising the FiO2 will improve oxygenation, okay? If you don't remember anything else from me, at least you'll remember that and I'll feel good about myself. Okay, let's talk for a minute about the lung compliance curve. You guys have all seen variations of this, right? This compliance curve means pressure versus volume. And what happens when you uh, combine pressure and volume on a, on a graph like this, you get this, this, this squiggly line where you have high compliance here in the middle, a little bit of pressure is a big change in volume, and low compliance over here and up here, right? It's low down here because of atelectasis. These are destabilized alveoli because remember ARDS disrupts surfactant. 
So now the lung is destabilized and they want to collapse, right? And so if the pressure gets low enough, they collapse. And then when you give them another breath, it takes a lot of pressure to pop those alveoli open again. And that's why the compliance is low down here. That's why the slope is so shallow, okay? Also remember that that damages alveoli. They don't like collapsing and popping open and collapsing and popping open. In fact, it only takes a few breaths to, to really do some tissue damage here, all right? At the other end of the spectrum, this is starting to flatten off again, low compliance again, because these are alveoli that are over distended, okay? So down here we have adelect trauma, up here we have volume trauma or barrel trauma. Which one's worse? I don't know, they're both really bad, right? We don't want to damage lung tissue, so we want to keep as much of the lung as possible here on the steep part of the curve. Everybody understands that, I think, right? But that, that's, that's part of the goal here. And so when we give somebody PEEP, what we're trying to do is inflate these atelectatic segments so that they come up here into the steep part of the curve. You with me? Everybody good with that? Okay. okay. Let's keep going here. All right. There are about 10 different ways to decide the best PEEP to use. And what does that tell you? That tells you that there's no good way. Otherwise, there would be one way. All right, but there are 10 different ways, so there must be a lot of bad ways. One of the easiest to learn, though, is a table method like this. And this is actually what the ARDSNET group used in their studies to decide what PEEP to use, and it basically correlates the FiO2 and the PEEP level. So here's our patient, 40%, 5 of PEEP. You can see that with 40%, you could also use 8 of PEEP, all right? But by the time you go up to 50% oxygen, they recommend that you go up to 8 to 10 of PEEP. Everybody see how that works? Okay, so you wanna keep the PEEP and the FiO2 roughly matched. There's also this high PEEP table that they used in some of their later studies. And we actually, true confession, we use the high PEEP table for a lot of our COVID patients. We still use it, okay, in some, in some cases. But this is very standard and you'll see this uh, uh, a fair amount, okay? So in this case, we can go up on the PEEP and I'm showing you a before and after here of five of PEEP, and then after we go up to 10 of PEEP. All right, everybody see that down in the input area? Okay, now look over at the output area and tell me what changed. Um, look, the peak pressure seems to have increased. Peak pressure has increased. Is anybody surprised? Not really, right? Because peak pressure it has three components, right? And PEEP is one of them. So we just increased the PEEP, so we expect it to go up. Now, let me ask you a more interesting question. Why did it only go up three points when we increased the PEEP by five? Why didn't it go up to 38? Well, remember the curve. What we were hoping to do is move some alveoli from that atelectatic part to the more compliant portion of the curve. If we succeeded in doing that, we may have impacted the overall compliance of the lung and improved it. You buying that? So we might have done something good here, all right? And that may be why we only went from 33 up to 36 instead of the 38. Everybody with me? Okay. Are we happy with 36? Shake your head no. We don't want 36, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's probably too high, but what do we really care about? Well, plateau pressure. the plateau pressure, right? So we want to know what's causing that high peak pressure. Is that peak pressure high because the plateau pressure is high or is that peak pressure high because the resistance and flow is too high? Okay, because that's, that's always, the, that's going to be our question. So we're going to measure the plateau pressure. Remember we found those buttons so we can do these maneuvers. And here's an inspiratory hold. Everybody's done this, right? So the, the, the monkey puts in the breath and then closes the valve, doesn't let the, the patient exhale, and the pressure settles down from the peak down to the plateau. And what do we see? Tell me what we're seeing here. Is this a lot lower than this? No. No, all right, so just visually, it looks like the plateau is pretty high. And if we look over here, what do we see? The difference is not high. Yeah, the difference is only three, which is pretty low. And the plateau is 34. 
What do you think about a plateau of 34? Too high. Too high, exactly. Okay, so we've got a plateau that's too high. What are we gonna do about that? Decrease the tidal volume. Great idea. What has probably happened is that we've moved some of the areas of the lung from down here up into the good zone. But some that were up here may have moved up into the volume trauma zone. And we don't want that because either of these will damage the lung, right? So now we need to bring these sections of the lung back down into the safe zone without letting the ones that are up here now slide back down into atelectasis. So PEEP is gonna push these ones up this way and lowering the tidal volume is gonna push it down this way. Now this is an oversimplification and you need to understand that, right? Because remember that ARDS is is a complex and heterogeneous disease. There are areas of the lung that are more diseased, areas of the lung that are more normal, and the compliance varies from region to region. So one graph can't show you the whole thing. This is just an aggregate, all right? So some areas of the lung move from here to here, but some other areas of the lung may have been here in the green zone and moved up to here, all right? So that's good. So. Here we are back at, what can we do to lower the plateau pressure? You guys already said it, we can lower the tidal volume. Let's try it, let's move down to 400. Okay, so all that changed here is we move the tidal volume down to 400. What do you see, what changed? Peak and plateau. You like that plateau better? What's our magic number? 30. 30, right, so we're below 30, woohoo. Okay, so we're below our, 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 our safe line here. Lower the better, but 29 is better than 34. All right, now what else changed? Our minute ventilation. The minute ventilation, good job. What was it before, do you remember? Like nine something. Well, it was, it was uh, 500 cc's times 20 breaths, so about 10 liters a minute, right? What is it now? eight liters a minute or so, right? Is that enough? Is that enough for our patient? Well, it might be for some patients, but remember with this guy with 10 liters a minute, what was his pH? What was his pH CO2? 65. It was 65. He was already acidemic, right? So what's gonna happen if we lower his minute volume from 10 liters to eight? It's gonna get... More acidotic and CO2 More acidotic, up. right? Now, how much? Well, we don't know, right? We're going to have to measure that with another blood gas after a few minutes. And is this going to be okay, or are we going to need to do something about it? Don't know, right? Sometimes we let people ride with a high CO2. What's that called? Permissive hypercapnia. Good job. Permissive hypercapnia. And in ARDS, we do that all the time down to, I don't know, what's your favorite pH? How low will you let somebody go? 7.25. Almost everybody is fine with down to 7.25, and a lot of us will say, you know what, if somebody's really sick, 7.2, I, I, would, I would take that, okay? Because I wanna protect the lungs, okay? If you're getting down to pHs below 7.2, now we start to worry about enzymatic function and other things happening at a lower pH. And so we might have to do something to keep that above 7.2. But depending on what this minute volume of eight liters a minute does for this guy, we might just live with it, okay? Now let's say though that it drops him down to 7.18. Too low, right? So what would you do? Increase respiratory rate. Good, yeah, simple thing, right? Just increase the, the respiratory rate to whatever, okay? Is that gonna cause a problem? Sometimes high respiratory rates can cause a problem, especially if we start stacking breaths, right? Is that likely to happen in him? No. Why do, why do you, I think you're right. Why do you say no? I mean, we're afraid in patients with asthma from auto peep, but, um... Good, he's got the wrong diagnosis, right? <laughs> That's exactly, uh, you know, listen, I'm with you, I agree. But even looking at the ventilator, we can tell, right? Look at this, his exhalation is getting back to zero really quick. 
Remember I told you flow is your friend? Flow is your friend. Look at that. He's got zero flow here for a long time. We could move this breath up quite a ways and not worry about stacking anything. That makes sense? Okay. So increasing respiratory rate would be very good. People with ARDS usually have very low time constants. In other words, they, they expel all their, all their volume really fast. People with asthma, not so much. Okay. That'll be your other case. Let me show you a quick trick here. Okay. If you're ever asked to look at a waveform and say, is this a pressure control mode or a volume control mode? Always look first at the flow. Okay. And remember that exhalation is always pressure control, right? It's just the pressure in the chest with an open valve and that pressure is just gonna push the volume out, right? So this is the waveform of a pressure control flow. So if the inspiratory flow waveform looks like this, okay, in other words, let me just switch to my pen here, okay? If this goes up like this, and then it comes down in a curve like that, sort of like this, only rotated around the axis, kind of symmetric around the axis. Everybody with me? Okay. This is the flow waveform of pressure control. This is the flow waveform of volume control, a straight line somewhere, either going straight across or down in a, in a triangle in a straight line. That makes sense? So anytime you see this, that looks like this swung around the axis, you know you're looking at pressure control, okay? That way you'll always be able to keep it straight. Anytime you see that shape, if it's curving down in sort of an exponential decay, you know it's pressure control, all right? Okay, let me erase that. Okay. So you guys got this, you got that. Okay, last point, and they might cut us off. We might drop out through the floor here any minute and go back to the main session, but what's going on in this patient? This is our same guy. Now we've lightened his sedation a little bit. What's happening? Remember, flow is your friend. What is the flow telling us? This little pink says that he's triggering that breath. He's not triggering this breath. See that? See this downward deflection and pressure? That's also him triggering, right? But what's this called? Two breaths right in a row. It's called double triggering. What's the problem with it? No exhalation, right? So he's stacking this breath on top of this breath and the machine thinks everything's fine. Exhale tidal volume 322, sir. Everything's good. Wrongo, right? because the rest of this breath is left inside. And the breath that, that this patient's getting for the second breath is whatever didn't come out plus the entire next breath. And if this breath only came out 100, then there's still 300 in there. And so the next breath is actually 700. Bad news for somebody with ARDS, right? Mm -hmm. Because we don't wanna over distend these lungs and a 700 milliliter tidal volume is bad. Okay, so remember that double triggering is bad news. What are you going to do about it? Increase sedation. sedation. You can either sedate him again, or you can give him a mode where he's got the ball, okay, where he can regulate that a little bit more. Maybe you are trying to wake him up and you don't want to keep him sedated, but you certainly don't want to let this go on for very long because it'll damage his lungs, okay? Any questions for, we have about 20 seconds till they're going to, we're going to drop through the floor, but anything not clear about what we talked about? Everybody feel a little bit better about ARDS? Piece of cake, right? Yes. <laughs> I actually think, and this is just me, but I actually think a red hot asthmatic is harder to ventilate than ARDS. Mm -hmm. So have fun in your next.
Hey, you know what? I uh, just talked for about two minutes with no with my mic on mute. Can that, it, for those of you guys that have your cameras off, if it's possible, can you guys turn your camera on so I can see you? I'm just love to see who I'm talking to. Thanks. I promise I won't uh, uh, send out any Facebook shots or anything like that. Okay, so I'm going to load my screen up. Um, let me make sure I can do that. Hold on one second. All right, can you guys see, uh, do you guys see my screen? Oh, you guys have to turn your mics on because yes. it's going to be a long one-way conversation. You can see the vent? No. Um, no. no. We just see your camera. Okay. Hold on. That's not what I want. Okay, hold on one second. Need to share my screen. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes. All right. And do you see the full screen or do you see the presenter? Do you see just the clips? Um, and the whole event screen here. Yeah. Fantastic. All right. All right. So, <clears throat> okay. So I know that you guys already went through some of the knobology, but I think it's always worth just going through again. So just to review really quick, does anyone want to tell me what the um, what the control parameter is in this uh, in, in this ventilator? It's volume. Good. How did you? Who said that? Ahmed. Yep. How did you know that? Um, from the flow, it's fixed on the inspiration. And um, I mean, from the volume flow as well, flow chart. Absolutely, so two, two ways, and that's great. So the easiest way is just look up here, watch this, volume control, right? <laughs> they give it right to you. Um, but the other way, which Ahmed appropriately said, is that we look at the flow, you can look at the flow. So the flow, uh, if I was to only have one waveform, I think I'd take the flow waveform. And not to say that the others are uh, inappropriate, Volume rarely is going to give you much in the way of information. So the second most important, I would say, is the pressure waveform. Now, we know that this is volume control because it says it up here. But the other way we can tell this is because you see here that this flow rate is absolutely rock steady. Remember during volume control, right, there's two things that are set by the operator, you, the flow rate and the total volume. So the flow rate, liters per second, the x-axis is seconds, so liters per second times seconds is going to give you the volume. So the area under this curve right here is going to be your volume. So this is going to go up to a set flow rate, and when it delivers that flow, it's going to uh, cycle off and then go to expiration, okay? Now you notice that the pressure curve, if you look, this patient's paralyzed, but if you look at this pressure curve, you can see there's some little squiggles in here. And the good news is, is that it's not because of a faulty computer, it's because the pressure component of this is on the other side of the equation of motion, right? So it's driven by the patient, okay? If we were in pressure control, what you would see is the pressure come up and it would be very steady, and then the flow rate might fluctuate slightly depending on the patient's physiology. This patient's on 50% oxygen. They have a PEEP of five. I think you guys talked about PEEP in the last case, so I won't go into that. We've set their respiratory rate of 24. And incidentally, we, we uh, uh, know that they're paralyzed for two reasons, or we know that they're not triggering the vent, I should say, for two reasons. One is, is that the respiratory rate in the patient-derived characteristics, which are over here, is the same as the given the, the set title, the set uh, respiratory rate. 
The second way we know that on this ventilator is because on the, on the maquettes, you'll see a little yellow line if the patient initiates their own breath and triggers it on their own. The Puritan Bennett ventilators will have a little C up here in the top left if the patient, I mean, I'm sorry, if the machine is triggering it, meaning controlled breath, or an A up here if the patient initiates that triggered breath and then the ventilator will assist the patient with the remainder of the breath, okay? So we talked about the input parameters. If you were to hit the additional settings button, you could see the flow rate that we were gonna deliver. And then over here, you can see what the patient's actually giving back. You notice that there's not, uh, that, that there is a, a, a volume over here, and we're gonna talk about that in a second. So. There's a couple problems with this ventilator waveform. So uh, let's go to Brian. Brian, tell us what you think is one of the problems that you might see with this ventilator. Let me give you a context for who this patient is. It's a 42 year old guy. He actually came into our COVID unit, okay? We thought that he had COVID, he tested negative. As it turns out, he just has rip roaring asthma. You there, Brian? You gotta unmute your mic. All right, how about Amanda? All right, Prince. Welcome back, Prince. Good to see you. Thank you. Um, so looking at the the pressure wave form, um, it looks like every time there's a up and then a down, there's no uh, break, there's no pause, and then it goes up again. Um, I don't know if there's anything wrong there, but that's, that's the first thing that sort of... Focus your attention right here. What do you notice about the flow right here at the end of the breath, at the end of expiration? If you were to go and breathe out, okay, what happens at the end of your breath? Are you still actively breathing out when you take your next breath? No, you come, it, you, you go to a zero. Yeah, you go to zero. Notice that this patient, right, do they go to zero? No. No. So what's going on here, right? Remember that the patient is not initiating the breath. We know that because there's no yellow line here and because the rate is the same as the rate on the ventilator. And what you notice here is that when the next breath is triggered by the ventilator, this patient is still passively exhaling here, okay? And so we call this air trapping. Now there's another clue, there's actually two more clues that this patient is air trapping. The first clue is that notice this ventilator says that it's the patient is getting an inspired tidal volume of 350 milliliters, which is pretty close to what we set. But what is the expired tidal volume? much lower, right? Okay. And so there's a discrepancy there. So one possibility is that they're getting 350 mils, but only 288 mils is coming out before the next breath goes in, i.e. air trapping. There's another reason why this could be lower than the inspired breath. Anyone know what other situation might cause this? An air leak, a cup leak? Yes, pretty. Good job. So if you had an air leak, right, if you actually had a disconnect in your expiratory limb or something like that, you might see this, okay, or a popped ET tube, right, where air is coming out around the tube in the patient's mouth. If you see this, the ventilator will probably start alarming and say something's not right, okay. The third clue that something is not right is that the peak pressure here is a little bit high. Let's talk a little bit about peak pressure here. So, um, Okay, so how do we know what's causing these high peak pressures? So first, I think the first question is, what is the peak pressure? Does anyone want to venture a, a guess of what I mean when I say peak pressure? Which of these three pressures, the resistive pressure, the elastic pressure, or the vent pressure, or pressure of the mouth, represents the peak pressure? The vent pressure. Say that again. The vent pressure. Absolutely. So good job, Pretty. It's pretty, right? Yes. Okay. 
So the peak pressure is the sum of the elastic pressure, which Dr. Ashton mentioned it is in your um, syllabus on the wiki site. And that is the, that, that elastic pressure is determined by the elastance or the inverse of the compliance of the lung, how stretchy the lung is, and how distended the lung is, right? So the lung wants to recoil inwards. The resistive pressure is determined by flow going through the airways or flow through the ET tube. So a small ET tube may cause a lot of resistive pressure. In this patient, small airways in the distal airways from boggy asthma is causing a high resistance. And so flow through there is gonna require increased pressure to, <clears throat> to uh, uh, go through, right? So, if this is the if the peak pressure is high, how might we know whether it's the elastic pressure or the resistive pressure that is causing the patient to have a high peak pressure? How could we discern which one? By eliminating one of them by inspiratory uh, pose. Love it. Good job, Alan. So good. So we're going to do something called an inspiratory hold, which you guys did in your last case, right? Okay. And as uh, you guys remember, when you do an inspiratory hold, you're simply cutting out the resistive portion of this equation because you're cutting your flow down to zero, right? Okay. And so when you cut your flow down to zero, um, <clears throat> you're going to have no resistance. I'm sorry, no flow. And so this pressure resistive is going to go to zero. Therefore, the pressure at the ventilator at that point is going to be only represented by the elastic pressure, how much inward recoil of the lung in the chest wall you have at that time. Now, if you had ARDS like you had in your last case, right, the majority of your peak, your high peak pressure would be taken up by the elastic component because you have a high elastins or a low compliance. In the patient who has asthma, their problem is not compliance. They have a normal compliance of their lungs. And the majority of this is a resistive problem. And so in this patient, when we do an inspiratory hold, I didn't get a picture of this, but when we do an inspiratory hold, what you would see is that the peak pressure would go from very high to very low. Now, incidentally, if you do an inspiratory hold and your plateau pressure goes down to normal, should you be worried about that high peak pressure? I mean, yes, this means the resistance is high. Fair enough. Let, let me ask this in a different way. You should be, you should be, um, you should be uh, worried, but are you worried about injuring the lung from that perspective? No. No, because everything is a resistive flow, right? You're not going to blow their trachea out, okay? And so you don't have to, the, the respiratory therapist, I guarantee you, is going to come to you and say, the peak pressure is 50. And you're going to say, what's the plateau pressure? And they'll say, I don't know. And so you go check the plateau pressure and it's 21. They're pretty reasonable, okay? At that point, you say, great, let's treat the asthma better. Let's lower the resistance. But what you're not going to do is adjust the ventilator like you did in the last case because your plateau pressure is not going to injure the parenchyma of the lung, okay? So that's a, an important point. Now, if we know that because this patient has a normal plateau pressure, we can do another thing to see what's causing this resistive pressure or how bad that is. And that's something called an expiratory hold, okay? Now, the expiratory hold helps us to learn whether or not we have something called auto peep. Anybody heard of auto peep before? Raise your hand. Good. All right, so some of you have, some of you haven't. So let me just explain the concept, okay? So auto peep really occurs when in normal lungs, when you breathe in, I want everybody to take a deep breath in and then just breathe out passively, right? You can breathe out pretty quickly passively. So you take a normal breath in and your inspiratory pressure, if you were to take a deep breath in and relax the inward recoil of your lung and chest wall, creates a positive pressure in your lungs and it causes air to flow from the lungs out through the airways to the mouth until the pressure at the mouth and the pressure in the lungs are in equilibrium. That's called functional residual capacity, right? There's an equal and opposite pressure in the lungs moving out and from the environment moving in. Everybody's square on that so far? 
Okay, so that normally happens pretty quick. And if you look at that from a graphical analysis, right, you breathe in to the end of your inspiration, then you breathe out back down to the functional residual capacity, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, right? Now, what happens if we insert something that causes an obstruction, whether that's a severe tumor or the patient's biting on their tube or the patient like our patient has severe asthma, right? So now you get a full breath in and you breathe out and because there's more pressure in the lungs, just like anybody who inspires, the inward recoil of the lungs is gonna push in and it's gonna wanna push flow out because there's a pressure differential. The problem is this obstruction is going to slow flow down. And so it's going to take longer for that equilibrium to be reached. Now, if the expiratory time, the time allowed for expiration, is not sufficiently long for these two pressures to equilibrate, the ventilator will fire the next breath before this pressure has gotten all the way back down to equilibrium, right? And so you'll still be expiring. Look at this patient here. What's going on here? The ventilator triggered before this patient had a chance to finish expiring, right? Okay. They're still expiring out. And so what you see is that they get a full breath in, three quarters of a breath out before the ventilator triggers again because of the set rate that you put in. The next breath is driven in by the ventilator because it doesn't know any better. And the patient breathes out at a slow rate. It doesn't quite get all that breath out, breathes in. And what starts happening to the volume in your lungs? If you want an idea of what it feels like to have this air trapping go on, take a breath in, breathe out halfway, and then breathe in again, breathe out halfway. You can see what the problem can be here, right? And so the, the problem is, is that pretty soon you're breathing way up here with the classic, what we call barrel chest, hyperinflated chest. Now, if we were to stop flow at the end of expiration right here, okay, then, uh, I'm sorry, if in a normal lung, we were to stop flow at the end of expiration right here, what we would measure is that the pressure in the lungs would be the same as our PEEP pressure, right? Because there was all the pressure had equilibrated. But if we measure the pressure here at the end of expiration, the pressure is still going to be higher than the PEEP pressure because this inward recoil of the lungs is still pushing air out and the pressure here is still higher than the PEEP pressure. In that situation, we call that auto PEEP. That's exactly what we did here. So if you look at the end of expiration here, we hit this button down here called expiratory hold, and you see that the flow goes to zero. There's no flow in, no flow out, okay? The only difference between this and an inspiratory hold is that this is at the end of expiration, and inspiratory holds at the end of inspiration, but it locks the circuits. And what you see here is that it measures the vent without any of the resistive components. So all we're looking at is what the elastic component of the lungs is. Now, if all that breath has come out, it should be in equilibrium with the PEEP. But in fact, what is the pressure in the lungs when we stop it at the end of expiration? Is it in equilibrium in this gentleman? No. Much higher, right? And so the difference between the PEEP and the actual pressure with no flow is what we call auto peep. It's how much air is still trapped in the lungs, propping those lungs open and preventing at the end of an expiratory breath, equilibrium from occurring. Let me stop for one second and just make sure that that's clear with anybody. Does anyone have any questions about that? All right, perfect. Now, there are some consequences of auto peep. I'm not going to talk too much about them, but I'm going to put these slides on the wiki site. You can scan it. There's an excellent seven minute video on what happens with auto peep. It's done by some of your colleagues at uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, I'm sorry, uh, UPMC. Um, Burton Lee, who's a master educator, is the one, uh, is the attending who helped make this video. I think it's a beautiful video. I highly recommend it. And uh, I don't have any uh, slice in the game 
but it's an ATS video lecture series video, so I thought I would shamelessly plug it anyway. So how might we correct the auto peak? Lower the respiratory rate. Yeah, did, good job, Freddy. Did you read that? <laughs> <laughs> I just realized that, uh, yeah, that didn't do a very good job of setting that slide up, did I? It was kind of a softball. Absolutely. So we're going to lower the respiratory rate. Now, let's think conceptually about this, right? So the patient has needs more time to reach that equilibrium. And so what we're really trying to do is create measures where we're trying to lengthen the expiratory time, right? So naturally, if we increase the respiratory rate from just under three seconds to just uh, to about five seconds, okay, we keep the inspiratory time at a half a second. Now we've moved the expiratory time from two seconds and some change to four seconds, right? We've significantly increased the expiratory time. And in fact, look at the PEEP measurement now. It's lower, it's approaching five, right? So we still have some auto PEEP, but not the degree that we had before, okay? And so what happens then is that we want to, we want to increase the expiratory time as much as we can. Now, what's another way we can increase the expiratory time? Anyone want to venture a guess? Increase the expiratory time? Yeah. How could you do that? Uh, the ratio, inspiratory to expiratory ratio. Good. So this is a half second inspiratory breath, I know, because that's what I set it at, okay? So the inspiratory time is a half a second. So what if we change the inspiratory time to a quarter of a second? So that would then take us from four and a half seconds here to four and three quarters seconds. The reason I illustrate this is that if you were given the option of decreasing the respiratory rate versus increasing the, um, I'm sorry, uh, versus decreasing the I to E ratio, right? Which would you choose? to maximize your expiratory time. Decrease respiratory. Probably go Absolutely. for the IE ratio. Say that again, friends. Um, I'll go for the IE ratio. So, so think about this. How much time did we gain by cutting this breath time in half, this inspiratory time in half? We went from a 0.5 seconds to 0.25 seconds. So we picked up 0.25 seconds, right? How much time did we get from cutting the respiratory rate from 24 to 12? we picked up about two full seconds. So if you were given the choice, every time you should choose the lower respiratory rate. Now you may not always have that option, okay? Because here's the thing, see this tidal volume here? And see this rate here? This rate was 12 beats per minute, breaths per minute. So when we dropped it in half, guess what happened about two minutes later in this patient? It started alarming, and look what it said. <laughs> okay? And so now we have a problem, because what's going to happen if I leave this? Patient could acidotic. You're right. And so this is the one situation in which increasing your tidal volume, maybe even above 8 cc per kilo, is acceptable. The one situation, Okay because you have to maintain a minute ventilation high enough that you can breathe off CO2 so the patient doesn't become overly acidemic. And that's the story of asthma. Any questions? Oh, sorry. I said that because uh, it said time remaining, zero. <laughs> and I thought it was gonna log me out. So I wanted to have a pithy ending statement, but I have 58 seconds. So let me- I have a quick question. Great. Um, so, you know how you said for volume control, you set the volume and the flow. Mm -hmm. Is there ever a clinical situation when we would think about changing the flow? Yeah, so the flow, right? If I set the flow rate here, let me, um, so if I increase the flow here, right, that's going to decrease the inspiratory time because it's going to deliver a higher liters per second, right, for mm -hmm. shorter seconds. So that will change the I to E ratio. There are some situations where patients are dyssynchronous and that's beyond the scope of this discussion where changing the flow to longer or shorter can help with the patient dyssynchrony, but certainly you will play with the flow quite a bit in your fellowship. All right, we got two seconds, so I may not take any more questions. Thank you.